So good afternoon, and we are coming here uh, live from Gilbert, Arizona, uh, Dublin, right? Uh, Belfast, close. Where are you at? Belfast in Northern oh, Ireland. Oh, Belfast, all right. Um, Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, Amsterdam? Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're from all over the world. Uh, we're getting ready to go ahead and start. I'm going to give just a moment for all the attendees to log in, and then we will begin in, in just a minute. And if you have any questions today, um, you can do those in the chat window, which is on your control panel. Um, we will take them as we can. Uh, we've got Taylor uh, monitoring those for us. Um, so she may pop in and uh, read us those. I'll do my best since I'm not doing uh, presenting today. I should be able to keep an eye on those on the chat questions as well. So we've still got attendees popping on. Uh, we'll begin in just a moment. Okay, we will go ahead and begin. Um, good afternoon again. I'm Lynn King Smith, uh, CEO at Ticket Force, and I'm coming to you from uh, Gilbert, Arizona. And this is level three. Um, this is our session on ticket, ticketing technology trends, and I am super excited about um, the the high level of um, brain power you've got on this uh, session with you today. So couldn't be more proud to have um, somebody representing the venue and box office side. That's Kathleen from Florida Theater um, in Jacksonville, Florida. We've got Andrew Thomas, um, tons of ticketing experience he will tell you about. I'm not sure what your current gig is, Andrew, but you are on the Intix board and um, make your way around the world talking ticketing and uh, helping clients. And then Greg Fahey, um, who's been working with us in his role previously as CTO at Ticket Tech and Soft Ticks and now Atomi Technologies. So I didn't mean to take your thunder, but uh, let's just go ahead and have um, each of you just give a real quick intro of yourself and a little bit about what you do. So I'll start on the left of my screen with Kathleen. Welcome, Kathleen. Hi. <laughs> Um, the box office manager at the Florida Theater, and previous to this, which I started here in 2015, I worked as the box office man senior box office manager for the 18 Bardavon 1869 Opera House and the Ulster Performing Arts Center in the Hudson Valley in New York. Uh, I was there for 15 years before I came here, I think. Yeah, I started all in all in box office itself in 2001. Prior to that, I sold tickets in high school and college at a video store, like Ticketmaster wow. outlet, way back when. <laughs> but um, yeah, kind of fell into it. And yes, that's that. pretty typical of ticketing professionals. And then mm -hmm. somehow you never get out. <laughs> yeah. But he runs a very busy box office, a growing venue, and um, uh, we're real proud to have her. And so that's, you know, we look for you to bring that side in here with these, uh, with these tech guys, bring them back to reality. <laughs> so Andrew, how about you? Um, I have been in this game for 21 years, one week and one day. Oh. Um, so I started out in um, pro sports in the UK, run a number of stadium in, in football and rugby, basically in ticketing or, or stadium ops roles. And then in 2007, I started to get into performing arts. So I worked for a vendor for, uh, for a while before having my own software company for four years, supplying mainly the nonprofit sector in the UK and Spain. And uh, for the last four years, I've been a consultant with my own consultancy company. Um, so uh, we work with venues, again, mainly nonprofits, but we're working with some big, very big um, soccer teams and attractions at the moment really looking at how we can engage better with our customers or potential customers and or make more money from them with the use of smarter technologies either either buying new stuff or just redoing what we're doing now to, to make it more effective so that's my story nice also on the board of intix correct 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 cool and mr greg uh, I'm also someone who fell into ticketing. Uh, my then girlfriend and now wife, uh, wife's brother, got me a, a job 
in, in ticketing in IT many years ago and uh, and so I fell into that and stuck around for quite a while um, and as you mentioned um, was most recently a CTO at, at Ticketek and Softix um, and uh, in moving my family back to Europe I, I just focused on the Softix side of the business for, for a little while and since the start of the year um, have been out on my own consulting and that's mainly ticketing um, and you know working working with you guys at Ticket Force and, and amongst amongst others um, but also just general um, technology consulting and, and really what I try to do is um, help uh, people companies get more out of the technology they've already invested in uh, a lot of the time rather than always trying to rush out and buy something new and add it on so that's where I tend to focus and um, Doing a bit of working banking at the moment, which is completely different to ticketing. <laughs> <laughs> I started. Yep. In, I started in banking. It was so boring. That's yep. how I got into ticketing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boring is not uh, what any of us call our jobs for sure. So, and I'm sure all the uh, attendees would vouch for that as well. So, um, all right. Well, we started off in our sound check. Um, getting into security right away. So we'll recap that a little bit, that discussion, um, because I brought up security on Monday in the opening session, just talking about what security means when it relates to ticketing. Um, and it, you know, Andrew said, which, which side of security? So we, we talked a little bit about, you know, the security of your data, secure transactions, um, all of that with, with breaches and things, but a little more on, security in our venues and how ticketing is going to play a part of that in keeping the venues safe. Um, so just to get us started thinking what technology or technologies um, do you guys think and then Kathleen maybe think ahead to what you would find yourself needing or wanting in your venue when you start looking years ahead um, that's going to help you keep your people safe and keep your venues secure. Um, as we say, from the bad guys. Um, so does that have to do with, um, you know, what fancy pants technology we're talking about right now or blockchain or all digital, any of those kind of things as it relates to security. But we can start with just keeping the people secure in the venues. So um, recapping some of the things that we already talked about. Um, maybe we'll start with you, Andrew. Yeah, I think I think you know we we, we let, let's take it back to the ticket purchase. We, we we've obsessed ourselves with making the purchase of a ticket as frictionless as possible, one or two clicks, making it easy as possible for me to get my ticket. We have to apply the same things I think to getting people into the venue. Um, so across from my hotel now, there are two concert halls. Um, it's ten past eight here, but if there was a half eight show. You know, could I still make it for curtain up? I probably could. If that was an airport, I couldn't because of these, you know, lines and securities and liquid checks. So, you know, away from the technology, I think we're going to have to focus on whatever we do, making it as easy and as painless to get in while still keeping people secure. Mm -hmm. um, and how we do that, it's going to be hard. And I think it will be a case of finding those non invasive technologies to try and. Um, and try and do that. Yep. You talked a little bit about facial recognition software. You want to tell us about that study that? Well, yeah. I, you know, I think we, we, we're going to touch on it a bit later. But but I did a trial or a, a proof of concept on facial recognition at Intix in Anaheim about three years ago, where we 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 got a software development kit and and hacked it around for a couple of weeks to see what we could come up with. And we came up with some tools which could, we trained it to pick out people in the audience that we knew would be there that were on our bad list. Um, and it did quite well. It did quite well. Um, the interesting thing, more than the technology working or in some cases not working, um, was the, the debate that raged after it about privacy issues, um, training of people, how do we find out? Do we suddenly deploy a SWAT squad because we think we've got a bad dude in the audience? So all those other systems that go around around it as well. But it was a huge debate about how intrusive it could actually be seen to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's always the line we walk. Now, I mean, Greg, you've worked without you've worked some pretty big events. I'm thinking of like the Australian Open where you've got a ton of people on hand and there may be security concerns or 
pre-lists of guests, something like that. So aside from facial recognition, um, what have you seen that can really help in those large scale events with security? Yeah, I mean, the, the, for a long time, um, there's been tracking of people in ticket systems, whether it's people who are um, consistently, you know, fraudulent in their purchase activity or whether they're um, known troublemakers at, at events or, you know, people with criminal records and so on. And there are um, more and more events happening around the world where um, there's coordination happening between ticketing um, operations and law enforcement. So the Rugby World Cup in New Zealand was a really good example of that, where a ticket to the Rugby World Cup was uh, gave you a visa to get into the country during the, the five or six weeks of the tournament. It was equivalent to having a visa no matter which country you came from in the world, which isn't normally the case. And so there were, um, there were um, criminal networks that were buying Rugby World Cup tickets often via secondary markets and then um, issuing those to people who basically wanted to um, migrate to New Zealand. And so there was a, a pretty significant um, police investigation around that, that you know, wow. back, in, back in my day at Ticketek were involved in. But things like, um, you know, facial recognition at, in, in large public places it, um, like airports and in football stadiums and that sort of thing. They've been around for a long time. There's a big buzz around at the moment about how that recognition is improving and people are seeing things like face ID on their phones. Um, but in, in those large scale applications, there really is still those human factors that Andrew mentioned that you have to take care of. You have to have a review where the, where the computer says, yeah, we think this is that person to a 90% probability. And then a human has to say, yeah, that, that is definitely that guy. Um, yeah. And then you have a process in place to deal with those circumstances, prepared and, and trained in advance. Yeah, but when you get right down to it, let's say you've got a, a bad guy. Kathleen, you don't know um, probably half of the names of the folks that are in your building, right? Because we're still basically, you know, people are buying tickets in groups of two, three, or four. Um, so if the bad guy is smart, um, then if they, they maybe they're going to obtain a ticket not as the primary purchaser um, and then we know we have ways around that but you know Florida in particular Kathleen has had you know an unfair share of bad stuff happen um, at, at some of your live events and so I imagine you guys talk about this and when you look to the future of keeping Florida theater really safe and secure. Are they coming to you? Or are they saying, what are we going to do in ticketing to really make sure uh, we know we're not letting any bad folks in the door? What kind of conversations do you guys have around that? Oh, we talk all the time regarding security. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we have pretty extensive security just to get inside the building itself uh, with bag check and wanding on every single event we have, whether it be a movie or whatever. And right. then, of course, the box office is always the first line of defense and entry point for everyone coming in and out of the theater. If we see brokers that are coming in and purchasing a lot, we go through our database almost daily trying to find those and identify them. So we know who's buying multiple, you know, orders of tickets, trying to make sure that those folks that are buying them are not going to get, you know, lost in the sauce kind of deal, as well as um identifying people that are coming in off the street asking our questions and we flag them as well just mm. to make sure we're keeping an eye out for anybody and then we all the key is communication between departments so right. we talk all the time in senior leadership just to make sure everyone's on the same page just trying to keep our audience safe i mean i talked a little bit about the nfl going to all digital ticketing um and because i went to a Bears game last week and headed to the Meadowlands uh, this weekend. So I'm having a good football season. <laughs> but um, with the, it was fun to experience that all digital delivery. I do mobile tickets most of the time anyway. Um, but they over-prepared for sure um, and uh, commented that they, I probably got, I want to say 20 is being nice to them in the last two days of texts and emails in regards to how I was supposed to retrieve my tickets as if I had never done that before. So I'm sure they're doing a, a very over communicating job, which is probably necessary to their audience in an all digital. But does that play a role? Do you guys see that as helping if I've got 
um, you know, they may be doing it for marketing reasons or whatever, whatever reasons they're doing it for. Does that help in the knowing who's in your venue or in the security? Because um, I could pretty easily share my ticket outside of that. And what are your thoughts on all digital? Do you, do you see that's where we're going? Andrew and Greg, you guys are all over the, the world really and what you see. Um, and we're really just starting to see that here in the US with the NFL where they're having these all digital deliveries. Is it, it are you jumping on that train? Well, do you know, the, the, the all digital thing I, I found, I, I was at a conference in network conference I organized in the UK uh, called Digital Professionals and our closing keynote in March um rob williams who's now with audience view did a great closing keynote and he talked he shattered all digital because he said you know not this one but you know a motorola phone a motorola e you can buy on ebay for 20 or 30 bucks so right. if the scalp is going to make hundreds of dollars mm. why not just buy a round of you know instead of giving you a piece of paper at a car park lynn i'm just going to give you this mm. yeah. You yeah, well, that. You know, so it doesn't solve anything tying it because these are so cheap now. Yeah, mm -hmm. You saw that um, when paperless first came in in the US and yep. the margins were was, was so good in the secondary market that the brokers would jump on a plane or they'd pay a college kid to jump on a plane and turn up at the door of the venue and swipe a credit card um, mm -hmm. to let the, the patron who bought the ticket in. So there, there is always a, a way around that stuff. And I mean, you can, you know, you can share a screenshot off your phone um you know until until you move to um you know one 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 time barcodes or or dynamic barcodes and i know that there are people sort of making efforts in that space where you mm. have a digital ticket with a barcode that changes every 60 seconds so if you share yep. it at a point in time um that ticket becomes invalid in 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 one minute and only the true holder of the ticket um has a barcode which is updating correctly that's one approach but um that you do still have um, the requirement that everyone comes in with a phone in that circumstance, right? And if I take my kids to a football game, um, they don't have a phone. They're not going to, and, and it's a pain sort of reaching back over the gate, trying to scan them in with my phone. So paper, mm -hmm. paper still exists. Yeah. And I think, you know, you know, going back to the face, then if you tie it to the face, then only this face can come in. Um, we've seen, thumbprints in ballparks now coming in on trials with biometrics again right. i've got security issues there about where's my thumbprint be, be, being shared to so yeah. you know there's a whole bunch of stuff here i think it's really interesting as well i'm seeing a lot of tech companies now who are looking at geofencing so this phone will only activate when it you know my barcode when it's within x meters or miles yeah. of the stadium and x minutes before gates open um, or check-ins as well but again we're putting if we're putting security barriers up and more complex check-in procedures we're just becoming airports but without the inevitable delays you know it, right. it, we're now becoming air, you know you know airports with curtains in theater mm -hmm. yeah it's true and you know um i think i think when it comes to getting people in the door that's why we don't go it seems like it'd be easy just put a name on a ticket and that was a trend for a while do you remember that like everybody i remember probably five years ago everybody was saying can i add a name to the ticket you know and they all wanted us to add that technology well we have the technology but can you imagine the the the, the line kathleen if you're checking ids at the door no thanks <laughs> you know so there has to be some level of um common sense added added to all of this uh, what what about blockchain for tracing that that ticket look at andrew's rubbing his head i can hear my crew out at the town hall just dying right now <laughs> yeah so i mean it's it's for all intents and purposes it's a buzzword that you, you can probably quite safely ignore at least for the the you know the near future um blockchain is really just a database and the difference right between a regular database and what blockchain does is that there isn't one copy of the database like you'd imagine in a traditional system. There's all these parties have their own full copy of the database. Mm -hmm. And when a change happens, a quorum of those parties have to agree that that change is valid and then it becomes a valid chain. So it's right. a lot slower than tra traditional transactional systems. It's like five transactions a second is is like sort of the, the um, in a, in a basic blockchain implementation is the transaction throughput limit. 
Um, and a lot of the time it's not giving you anything that you couldn't have gotten from a traditional IT system. So mm -hmm. I'd be aware I, at the moment, I say. <laughs> I, I, I have copyrighted and trademarked a phrase that explains blockchain to box offices. Okay. Which, which is blockchain to box offices is basically bacon. <laughs> Uh, and I love bacon, but I don't understand. <laughs> what if Kathleen likes bacon? No. <laughs> yeah, so, so, and uh, so, let me explain. So, I came up with this yeah. at a conference, and everyone went, "This is going to be a big reach now." So, no box office will be improved directly because of bacon. Mm -hmm. However, if you have a big on sale, you could possibly think about having bacon rolls for your staff in the morning to keep their energy levels up so they don't want an early lunch so we can really hammer the phones. It hasn't sold, bacon has not sold out that show. You've just used it to, tr to tw tweak a piece of performance. Yeah. And people keep talking about blockchain that it will destroy and change everything. As Greg said, I think it will have some in impacts once it's been you know the things have been tweaked out but it's really not the be all and end all to completely destroy the the existing box office it's yeah, finding that it's finding the bacon sandwich moment for blockchain and i don't think anyone has yet found that i my my view at the moment um, i love it <laughs> i'm always i'm always um looking to change my mind by by learning a bit more but um my view at the moment is it will have much more application in in the b2b space so um Certainly, um, back in my previous role, we dealt with a lot of government-owned venues um, that were run by trusts that were appointed by the state government, and they have quite um, strict and um, ever-increasing audit requirements. And so, every year, you get auditors come in and look at your system. Same as um, you know what I've been talking, Lynn, with Brad about with um, Nevada Gaming, right? You have a mm -hmm. similar sort of thing there. And really, um, it's either an audit requirement or there's um, tax collection involved where your system has to prove that it is transacting in an accurate way. Now, a blockchain setup can serve well there because you can have a private blockchain network where the ticketing company um, has half of the network and the auditing party, whether that's a government, whether that's a, a private auditor or whatever, has the other half of the network and they continually agree that these transactions are happening and that, they, and that they're accurate. So you don't have this whole end of year, three weeks, an auditor comes in and goes through all of your reports and, and watches you use the system and all that. You agree that, that this um, blockchain system is keeping an accurate record that both parties have visibility of, that things are, are being done the right way. So it has that sort of application. Right. Um, but in the consumer space, I think it's there's not really any, um, any genuine... Um, even proof of concepts that have that have really shook the world yet. See, I love the common sense panel. But Kathleen, I want to close out the security portion here because um, we can talk about things that are more fun. <laughs> um, but do you get do you feel a need to have a more complete manifest for your building, even if you're not checking ID, but at least the purchaser? Like, do you see that um, you may want to limit on certain shows? that people can only buy, say, two tickets. So every, or, you know, do you ever see having a single ticket limit or anything like that at all so that you've you've got a more complete manifest than one out of every four, one out of every six people actually having any record of that purchase in your system? Do you guys talk about that at all? Oh yeah, definitely. We generally keep an eight ticket limit on most events. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, according to whatever the audience is or the performer is, you know, depends on how many we definitely narrow that down to. But the majority are like four to eight, nothing more yeah. than eight. Even on yeah. our three events that are like, you know, a cultural event, we'll keep it at eight just to make sure we don't have too much uh, shenanigans going on. Right, right. Um, you know, because it seems, I just keep thinking that at some point they're going to, you know, some people may want to say that government organization or security or whatever we're working with may say, I need a manifest of the people in the building, um, the people that purchased. And, you know, we have that on airplanes, but we have to check IDs. We don't want to necessarily go that route. But um, that's something that we keep thinking about as a way to make that so we've got more complete idea of who's in the space, um, not necessarily, or at least who originally purchased that ticket, not necessarily uh, I can't see us going to IDs, going to events that would just feel like we're in a whole other world. 
Um, and if you think about it, I mean, even though we have millions of people going to events every day and staying safe, um, and so there's there's a lot of that too, but it's just a matter of keeping to think. I just want to be thinking about what's ahead and what we need to do um, as providers and technology folks um, to meet those those changing needs. But well, that I love it. The bacon. Let's make sure we tweet that out and put a. Uh, uh, put a trademark next to it for Andrew Thomas. <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about platforms outside of ticketing that do some pretty cool stuff because as you know, there's people writing new stuff all the time and, and uh, Greg and Andrew, I think I have both of you guys on here a lot because um, well, I like you and you're great, but also because you're very common sense with technology and you really take that, that approach of if it doesn't make sense, why would we do it? But um, you know, we're offering up now an easy way for people to integrate platforms outside of ticketing um, in large part so that we can focus on having good solid ticketing platforms. And as the new stuff starts to roll out, you let other people develop that and, and tie in. Um, so what are you guys seeing? And then Kathleen, maybe when you jump in on what's what's on your wish list for um, some of those platforms that are outside of ticketing that help us do our job better or make a better customer experience. And, and if you're gonna, if we'll talk about it, what's, what's the win for either the box office or the venue or the consumer on it? What are you seeing out there? Me specifically? <laughs> Anybody, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. It would be awesome to have more integrations, different marketing, even outside platforms like music, you know, people who use social media or not social media, but like Spotify and things like that, direct linking to a ticketing system. I was thinking about that last night because my daughter, you know, is of the age she's starting to go to concerts and stuff just to be able to like market to teenagers or, you know, older, you know, early 20s, the um, ability to be able to purchase the tickets directly from like Spotify or Pandora. They might mm -hmm. be able to do it now, and I'm just not aware because I'm not on it all the time. But that would be really, like, fortuitous to be able to do something like that, I think. Yeah, they took a stab at that a little bit when Pandora bought Ticketfly, but the match wasn't made in heaven because Pandora's market is me and Ticketfly's market is uh, your daughter, <laughs> uh, by and large. So, you know, they will often advertise concerts uh, and they still do, even though that Pandora's offloaded Ticketfly now, uh, they still have that, that little bit of that plug in. But again, it has to be kind of, for it to work, it's got to reach across all the platforms. Um, so it doesn't really do any good if you're saying I'm listening to a show, but I don't have an integration with that ticketing system for that show in my area. So, um, but I think the thought pattern was okay. I'm listening, I like this artist, they're in my town, and so why not buy a ticket? That the pattern was okay, but it wasn't um, all encompassing quite, quite enough. Um, they'd have to open up really and say, you know, we want this to happen. Um, and then of course they're gonna want a piece of the pie. Everybody wants a piece of That's the pie. That's always a big part of the challenge, right? That I mean, from a technical point of view, you can make thing, these things work and sometimes they're not that hard, not that expensive to do. Sometimes they're really hard and really expensive to do. Mm -hmm. um, and you make a decision about whether whether one or another is worth it at any point in time. But um, um, that it, it does often come back to that discussion, right? So what's my piece of the pie? Um, and there's often not that much pie to go around um, <laughs> on, a, on a given ticket. So, or bacon. Uh, yeah, and, and, and the other thing, of course, is that or bacon. Um, that, that um, you know, people that are coming along and wanting to integrate with, with ticketing are not just necessarily looking for a transactional cut either. They're wanting to um, tap into the, the flow of data that's going um, up and down, up and down the industry value stream, right? And they want to sort of insert themselves there and get a hold of that data as well. And um, you know, I think rightly, people have become, um, you know, or um, organisations have become more protective of that um, and and its commercial value in the last ten years. Um, um, you know, ticketing and venues and promoters have have worked out over the last few years how to work better together on on getting value out of that than, than they did in the past. 
Um, but it's also become a lot more problematic the more people you have involved in this data um, picture because with things like GDPR, you have to really have a really tight handle on, on where your data is going, who's touching it, what they're doing it with it when they get it. Um, because otherwise you can end up in a situation where you're, you're subject to really severe penalties. And, and I think you're going to see more of that legislation come in around the world rather than less of it. And I think that I something that like, I think like TixTrack is a good example of a platform that had something to offer to the venues mm -hmm. um, because it would help them know how to scale and how to sell and how to price their house. And what they did well was um, that they integrated with multiple platforms. So they didn't just come in and say, you know, well, you have to be on platform X, you know, only audience view is going to integrate with TixTrack. They went multi multi platform um, so that they could hit as many markets as possible and um, so that's a good example of one that I saw that br brings real value in um, because there's an obvious benefit to the venue there um, to use that um, but I get hit all the time I'm I, Andrew what are you seeing with kind of these plugins or these external platforms there's a couple here which is that you know the the as I call it the hard and heavy um, integration where a whole bunch of smart people from Ticket Force and System mm -hmm. A are going to have to get together and agree how the sprites are going to talk to each other. And mm -hmm. 12 months later, it may start working, and then no one really wants that 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 connection. And we we do business cases for it, and then you mm -hmm. scope it and all these other things. But it's a long time to get somewhere which doesn't really help Ticket Force. Mm -hmm. or system a and then and then kathleen's got system b so that's another thing going on here so, Didn't help so her. <laughs> yeah so i'm I mean, this is technical talk um yeah. the, the but what i'm seeing is is the more kind of cooperative and i wouldn't even go as far as say their integrations they're they're like rub ups or or you know or or coming togethers where um you know, for example, trying to sell things in a ticketing flow that are not tickets is normally really painful or clunky or it fudges your figures. So I'm thinking car parking, gin and tonics, ticket insurance, hotels. So again, mm -hmm. what we're seeing in you, I'm seeing a lot with the, with the venues I work with is integrating at the um not the basket level or in the flow but actually really nicely into the confirmation page i'm rendering hotel options and restaurant options there because i've done the most important thing to my venue or my promoters is i've sealed the deal i've got your ticket revenue you are coming mm -hmm. to my event if i start serving you up you know insurance hotels restaurants i might start click click clicking away and then going mm -hmm. off from where you know especially this millennial culture or younger people that are more distracted you know we've we've done all the marketing work to get you in the flow and then we've given you 101 reasons to leave it um so what we i'm seeing especially is more demand now or or request for these lighter integrations where again there's a mutual um beneficial um from cooperation so you know, if you sell a hotel, um, Kathleen, that you get a split of that hotel commission, Ticket Force get as the vendor who built the integration get it, and the hotel company gets it. So it's a, a tripartite kind of win. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think there are definitely things that make sense to offer as part of the ticketing transaction, but then there are others that that really belong outside of it. And, and I think the mm -hmm. temptation to sort of shove everything in there as part of the ticketing transaction um comes a lot from um the friction in the payment process which is um, something that's improving you know month by month really i mean it gets easier and easier to pay for things online um you know i i don't even pull out my card anymore i just scan a barcode on a web page with my phone and and it I thought takes you're gonna say your finger <laughs> no 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 no, I just hold up my phone and take a photo of a barcode on the web page and it pays for whatever I'm buying and it, it's super easy. And well, um, I never have to give my card details when, I, when I'm paying for anything. Um, uh, Greg, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I do a bit of work in, in Netherlands and, and the Benelux countries, but yeah. would you agree that I think the, the kind of peer-to-peer -peer payments and split billing kind of tools that banks offer are, are way ahead in those regions to other parts of the world? Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely Benelux, um, 
you know, small, um, fairly homogenous markets, fairly advanced banking markets, um, and yeah, payments work really well. And you know, now one of the leading payment companies in the world is a, is a Dutch company um, in Adyen. But I mean, exactly the same. That that works in exactly the same way as um, as WeChat's payment system does, right? You just scan a barcode. You can do it in a in a Seven Eleven. You know, a barcode pops up on a little display, and you scan it with your phone, and you pay for your your um, chocolate milk or whatever you're buying at, at 7-Eleven. So, um, you know, getting back to the ticketing transaction, that idea of, of, of booking a hotel afterwards or booking a flight, um, you know, it doesn't, if you think about it, if I'm buying tickets to a show, um, it doesn't really make sense to be committing to a particular hotel room in a particular property at that time because yeah, um, I totally don't want to. Yeah, you know, you, it, it, it might be six months before you even uh, before the show comes around, and, and are you really going to make your travel plans that far out, and all those sorts of things? So I think reducing payment friction is makes the sort of integrations Andrew talks about much more feasible. But, but you know, I'm doing I'm doing a piece at, at Intix in in um, in January. Where is it? Should know this. It Texas. is uh, Texas. Yes. Yeah, and it, and the the piece is called it's called No Exclamation Point. We need to be more in caps like airlines, and we're focusing on three or three or four things that the airlines do really well which is you know I, i've got six three or four flights six five 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 six flights this week and i keep getting emails about have i got my hotel booked and do i want fast pass security and car parking mm -hmm. so as greg says i've got no idea what i'm going to eat tonight and that's probably in about 26 minutes time oh, um, so 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 you know, asking me to choose a menu option or a hotel six months out is yeah. never going to happen. But, you know, we've got the data. Have we got the tools? Have we got the partnership to go back and hit Greg a week before? Hey, Greg, have you got your hotel sorted? Here's a selection of hotels. Right. And again, goes, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so we've got this stuff to do. We just need the tools to do it effectively. Um, and the partnerships in place. We don't need these hot and heavy integrations. Yeah, it's a, it's a similar story, I think, Lynn, to your NFL tickets where you were getting all of those alerts on how to do the same thing. Um, there's a, a concept that if you talk to people in, in, in the product side of technology, um, a phrase they use is next best action. So when they're, when they're figuring out how things work between um, you know, they're online and they're mobile and even, you know, box office and call center and all of, um, you know, online chat, email marketing, um, information emails, thinking about the life cycle of your customer, what they're going through and what's relevant to them at that point in time and therefore what is the next best action. So, you know, Andrew talked about geofencing. If I'm walking towards a venue, the obvious thing to offer that customer next is a super fast and simple way to open their ticket. Give them a push notification so that they can open their ticket as they go towards the venue. Um, if it's you know the morning of your flight, maybe um, send them a message and say, "Do you want to do you want to order your your food for the plane tonight?" But you know, don't send it three months in advance. So that concept of next next best action, if you can focus on that in all of your customer interactions across all of your channels, I think you can deliver something much smoother. So, so, so we have a startup in the UK called Crowd Engage, which is a really nice piece of, of kit, which does that next best action via SMS, which is which is the kind of venue instructions and parking and bits and pieces three hours out, and then by geofencing will surface your passbook or the email in in your ticket, or give you a an SMS with a link, a deep link to to to, to, to pull your ticket. So we're starting to see the again these pop-ups and startups who are being creative, um, and the best thing is you know so so does every vendor go out and copy that, or just integrate with it? And if a venue if Kathleen wants to do it, she can just do the the twenty five bucks subscription and and use that kind of product. And I think that's where we're going to see real innovation is in these small agile kind of startups. It's got to be a little quicker, you know, um, because you can, like you said, if you choose a platform that's safe for CRM and we want to integrate that. Um, so we, you're right, we work hard for a year, we get that going, and then somebody wants to use a different one, <laughs> you know. So um, Kathleen, what are you seeing? What is your marketing team? 
asking for, um, except for the world, of course. But what what do they want as far as integrations with with what you do um, on delivering ticketing services? Are they are they popping in saying we here's what we'd like to do? Uh, not so much. I mean, everything that we do, Ticket Force pretty much supplies. I mean, we don't really have. Uh, a lot of outside I mean we do the mobile ticketing and we do the printed home ticketing uh, and you know a lot of this is educating your audience uh, when you talk about um, uh, getting all these other like add-ons and stuff into the system what worries me is yeah. the integration of the two and them working cohesively all the time like here in Jacksonville we've got this our theater, we've got all these SMG venues as well, as well as the, the stadium. And when we all have events going on, we have a real infrastructure issue. Um, people can't access data on their phones, whether they're on Wi-Fi or they're trying to access anyway. So even if you have geofencing going on, people can't access stuff. You know, mm -hmm. so we are constantly educating our audience by when they come in and showing them how to use their phones and showing how to bring tickets up and showing how them how to take pictures of their tickets so that they are able to do it. When you were saying that you got hit like five or six times with all kinds of information on how to access your tickets, I kind of wish I had that sometimes. Some <laughs> yeah. people really have um, a hard time accessing their tickets. And I mean, it seemed pretty smooth coming in the, like I was watching to see how people were doing on an all digital event. I mean, and, it, and it's mid season, so they've had, you know, seven or eight games or so uh, already under their belt. Um, and I didn't see, uh, I didn't see long lines. I didn't see people struggling with their phones. You know, I, I, I didn't really see that. It may have been different on the first game. Um, and we talked about how, how they initially kind of screwed up because they said we wanted to do all digital. But if you remember, they forced it being just through the Ticketmaster app. And they launched that with about four really large events on the same day. And the app crashed. Right. So they've now said, well, that doesn't work well, so we've need, we need to give them you know, seven different ways to get their ticket. Um, I think there were five, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there were five ways to access um, my tickets. And um, you know, I wanted to make sure too, uh, yeah. because otherwise you get to dig through email and try to find proof that you actually bought the thing. And you know, it's funny that that's how I think of it as a consumer, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're right. So Andrew. Yeah, but in a, in a, I want to circle back round to what Greg was saying about blockchain um, and not mention bacon. But the barcode has been with us on tickets, depending on whose pattern you agree with, for 21, 22 years, maybe. And mm -hmm. we're still not managing to nail scanning a barcode. If it's on a phone, a piece of paper, a piece of, you know, you know, uh, thermal ticket, there mm -hmm. are still venues who are not managing to do it. And that's mm -hmm. a, a perfect example of a, of a simple piece of technology with a definite application mm -hmm. that was still not getting right in ticketing after 20 years of it being around. Right. We get it right at the grocery store. Um, you know, when we're yeah. buying bacon. So <laughs> yeah. now I want bacon. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, you know, I'll never forget this conversation that I had with um, Brian Arnon when he was first at Ticketfly, when they were just a startup, and I hopped in the elevator with him, and you know he looked ragged from traveling all over. Um, and I said, "How you doing, Brian?" And he goes, "You know what?" Um, he said, "I'm really sick of building stuff that nobody uses," and and that was kind of his um, his angle at, in the beginning days because they I'm sure they they had a ton of money, they had all that capital invested. They had to keep people happy and tell their investors they were building some really cool stuff. At the end of the day, Kathleen, you want to get people in the door. You know, you want to sell tickets fast, get rid of the, get rid of any barriers to that. And you want to get people in the door quickly. Um, so, you know, you guys are also common sense here that um, it, it really does come back to that. And we try to drive it back to that. Um, but there's an awful lot of shiny objects out there to chase uh, in the meantime. And, um, you know, for me, sometimes it feels like it can make me sound like I'm a killjoy if I say, well, what are you chasing that? You know, how is that going to help you or is it going to make things more complex? So I think I'm going to I can summarize this coming back 
to Andrew, what you said about keeping it more of a handshake type um, of really quick and easy and agile if we're going to integrate with with platforms. Yeah, I, I, but I, I do like Greg's next best action. I think I think we should all have that in everything we do in our interactions sure. with a customer. What's the thing that this customer is the best thing to offer them right now? I think that I think we can take a lot from that phrase. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got I've got. I think three things to say on, on this particular oh, subject. I'll, I'll try as, I'll try to be as brief as I can about each of them. One is one okay. is that um, you know the the types of um, interactions that that Andrew is talking about have become easier and easier to implement over the years, right? Um, super straightforward to do in a lot of cases, um, but they can still tie up a lot of your time figuring out how how you're going to make that integration make sense for your customers. And I think that Eventbrite is a really good example of taking that way too far, right? They they used to integrate with every, or they probably still do, integrate with every single thing that comes along in the market. Mm -hmm. And I think they just burn a whole bunch of time on doing that stuff instead of building out their ticketing features. And mm -hmm. you know, I think for a company that sells as many tickets as they do or processes as many tickets as they do, they should be doing a lot better financially. And I, I feel like they're, just they just integrate with everything. Too. I'm I'm being perfectly blunt. I didn't blunt. pay. And, I didn't pay him to say this. <laughs> but you can be because they're a listed company now, right? So we can say whatever we like about them. That's true. Um, the the second thing is that um, we talked about security up front, and I don't know if this was in the conversation just before we came online, Lynn, or um, or you know once once the audience came in. Um, but talking about some of the breaches that have happened recently, there was the Ticketmaster one, British Airways. Those things come about because these integrations are really easy to do. And it's simple for someone in your marketing team to say, yeah, yeah, let's put that script on the checkout page and track um, what our customers are really putting into their carts or not, whatever your um, objectives are. That is the attack vector for stealing people's credit cards on checkout pages. Right. So you've got to be really careful about that stuff. Mm -hmm. The third is, and this does tie into the next best action. Um, and uh, I, I have start, I started using this about two or three years ago when it became public out of Amazon. They use this process called working backwards or press release driven development. And you can use it for technology development or you can use it for changing a process that will um, affect your customers. And the idea is that when you start one of these efforts, um, you start off by writing the press release that you're going to send out to your customers that explains exactly what you're doing, right? And you don't do anything until you really refine that message that will get sent out. And the objective is at the end of your project, you will literally send out that that release. And so if you're you know, doing digital tickets in the NFL, you set up your project with a really clear message about how we're going to explain to customers about using their digital tickets and what's the right way to download it and not fall back to just sending 100 emails the day before the event. And mm -hmm. so you, it really forces you to think very clearly about what it is it's like creating an elevator elevator pitch for your project right and then you write right. the FAQ. then you write the faqs is the next step then yeah. you write um a user guide for how you're going to use that thing like if it's changing a screen in your application and then you actually then get you into actually the write it so yeah. it, it really helps you to refine the idea down to something that is much more likely to be successful because if you can't make it clear at that first step there's a very mm -hmm. good chance you're building the wrong thing mm. i love it and there's a, there's a really good post on LinkedIn, a guy from Amazon explains how it works. So I'll send you the link and you can share it around. That would be um, great. If people, if people that has got to be difficult that. for software developers and software salespeople though, because how is this new feature getting on, Lynn? We're just writing the press release. You I know. <laughs> yeah. I actually, the salespeople are selling it, you know, years ahead. <laughs> it, is, it is stuff for sales, but I actually used to get um, my developers to write the first draft of it because it was another tool for getting them more connected to the business and understanding the problem that right. they were solving. So well, we just hide it from sales. So yeah, <laughs> yeah and sorry, I should point out because um, I had this conversation with someone the other day. Once you write that press release at the start, you don't send it out. Then right, you you go ahead no. and you, finish, you go ahead and finish it, and then you send it out. <laughs> well, unless you're publicly traded and you want your stock to go up. Right. Then you send it out way before you build it. <laughs> you know, just you know, I know, I know, you know, we're trying to keep under an hour, but you know, this is an important thing again. Picking up on what Greg said is, why are we doing this? Who's it good for, and what's the benefit? Which obviously, what this process 
you know, yeah. kind of gets to. But a lot of integrations, especially the hot and heavy ones, are, you know, department to departmental kind of um, efficiency dreams. And they are dreams of how we're going to save thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year by, by integrating with a finance system or CRM system. So, you know, part of the job I do as a consultant a lot of the time is look at these and say, it is not worth your time and effort to automate or, or API or integrate this process. Mm -hmm. It's never going to have a payback. Kathleen, how did you get, or is it just how you're wired? How did you get so smart about, you know, um, staying true to the core of what you do? Um, just what these guys are talking about. And because um, I, I do get a lot of questions from box office managers that they are kind of chasing shiny objects that they think they're going to solve some problems for them. And in the end, maybe not. And you don't seem to be wired that way. Bacon? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> Andrew's super hungry right now. He's going to have a BLT or something across the street. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I don't know. Just uh, you know, the most thing that I, I like to keep true to is customer service, and making sure our audience keeps coming back because they like us here, and that we're constantly trying to help them on that level, and we're bringing them quality programming, and mm. that's pretty much it. You know, I with all the digital and everything that we're doing these days, there's a, a loss a little bit between the box office and the actual ticket buyer. And I'd like to bring that and keep that true all the time. So, you know, and there's always that guy who wants that ticket to mm -hmm. put in a frame with his picture, you know, to remember always. I mean, that's always gonna be there, I think. Um, I don't know. I'm just an old head, metal head at least. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, think it, I think it becomes really easy for us to forget that it does going to an event should be fun right it's meant to be exactly. an enjoyable experience you're it's it's entertainment it should be entertaining and that goes right from the beginning of you know where you find out about and, and how the marketing of an event is positioned to buying the ticket to you know getting in at the venue and, and not having to deal with traffic and all of that sort of stuff right. as well as enjoying the show it should be a fun experience exactly mm -hmm. we're selling an experience i want everyone to have a really good time when they come in here so from buying the ticket to going to get a beer to going and sitting down, it should be seamless, and we're here to help them have a good time. So, right, I don't know. Let's well, just think about it. Let's take the last couple minutes because um, I one thing that I talk a lot about is the more high tech we go, then the more high touch we have to go. Um, and maybe an example of that is you know, the getting 20 emails about how to get my tickets. That was a pretty high touch. It wasn't a personal touch, but there was a lot of contacts involved with that. Um, and in our phone room here at Ticket Force, we've, we've had to adapt our, our model used to be like, you got to get them if they're not buying a ticket, you know, 10 years ago, then, um, you know, get them through the call and do some customer service. But we didn't like walk people through online if they were having trouble, those kind of things. Now we just say help them whatever they need. And about 50% of our calls is just helping people, whether it's, you know, accessing that mobile ticket or figuring out how to reprint their print at homes or whatever it is that they're, and so we'll sit there with, you know, some of the older buyers and walk them through online and not get paid a dime for doing it essentially. Um, and so we've sort of changed our motto over the past little bit that it's not every call just has got to turn you know, into a sale. Um, but wh what are you guys seeing for, for better customer service? Kathleen, you said you feel like we're losing it a little bit on, on the high touch. Um, are you guys seeing people introducing, I mean, I hear people asking about chat. Uh, live chat for customer support on our ticketing sites. Um, so as we as we get more complex, where does that take us in terms of serving the customer? And we've got about five minutes left, so jump in as you have something to say on that. Well, I, I think that live chat um, is definitely a channel you've seen a lot of growth in. Um, but the mm -hmm. other interesting thing is that um, you know AI has got a lot of buzz or machine learning and mm -hmm. chatbots. Is, is one area where technology has really proven quite successful in the last couple of years, building building chatbots that can respond to people. And, um, you know, lots of us um, put efforts into this in call centers with natural language recognition sort of seven, eight, nine years ago. Um, 
and the systems were okay and, and everyone's got those things on their phones now with Siri and other uh, virtual assistants but um, mm -hmm. the, the nice thing about um, chat is that it's much easier to figure out what someone's asking when they're typing it in rather than when they're saying it. You're not dealing with accents, you're not dealing with um, as much colloquial language and all of these other sorts of problems that voice has. Um, mm -hmm. So there's been some good success in building AI chatbots that can respond, that can that can answer the question like, okay, I'm going to this NFL game. I, I did, don't read any of my emails. Um, how do I get my ticket? Um, yeah. you know, they can answer questions like that intelligently. Yeah, true. I've seen a lot, I've seen that really grow. I don't like them in some cases. Um, as soon as I get on a website, I don't care for it if it's going to pop up and ask me to chat every two seconds. But there yeah. are times where it can tell that I'm maybe shopping around a little bit and could use a little help, and then I and then I do like to interact with them. Okay, and I've seen them get a lot better. Yeah, I, I, th I think the the you know while I was just getting before I got on the call, I was I was on with my mo uh, cell cellular carrier to add a package to. For my to use in the US, and it was all it was all via chat. Um, it hmm. was apparently Monica. Whether Monica was a real person, because she didn't so, she didn't seem to understand. So sometimes I do actually have to ask, "Are you a bot?" Um, but you know, AI is good. I think the the one that's getting me a bit is is from a phone room. Lynn is I don't want to phone up. I want to while I'm walking to the store or to a BLT across the road. I want to at ticket force hey my ticket hasn't turned up or how do i download my ticket sure. i want to be my social and i've got a couple of clients at the moment who have been retraining staff to multitask mm -hmm. so to yeah. serve up with social because we've all been on the phone with clients uh, who are trying to buy tickets and we say yeah we've had a lot of troubles with our website because it doesn't it's not very good at doing that <laughs> if I'm doing it, if I'm saying that to Kathleen, it's a one to one. If I'm doing it via social and not DM, it's it's a one to many, or it's a screen mm -hmm. grab and and tweet. Mm -hmm. um, and I really hate the fact that we're getting we're getting to to social media customer service. And I've got a note here: the airline I'm flying with uh, back to Wales uh, on Friday. They they log in at eight oh one, and it's hey, it's Lynn and Greg here doing your social media through till six, mm. and then we shut down. So between six at night and eight a.m., there is no customer service by social. There's a call center, but but airlines mm. are not you know airlines are not you know ten hour a day businesses. Um, so I think we we have to respond you know, and whether it's through. Um, great portals or anything else give our agents the chance to communicate with our customers how our customers want to communicate with us mm -hmm. because yeah. unless unless we do that we're not going to adapt yeah that and that that eight till six example is a great um a great example of companies not seeing the long-term value in investing in in good customer service i mean you can if you're if you're treating your customers like that then for sure your customer service costs are going to continue going up and up and up and up because you're not you're not ever thinking about how am i making this thing that they're trying to do easier and permanently easier for all of my customers they don't have that mindset they're just um you know firefighting all of the time and and i think companies that invest well in and uh, you know whether it's a venue whether it's a ticketing company um, whether it's a retailer, invest well in providing good customer service. Um, they see the long-term payoff in that um, compared to those that don't. For sure, Kathleen, you guys do your own phones down there and walk up. So your your box office folks or customer service any way they can. Do you do any of the social channels or anything? We have a we have a social media specialist that handles all of that who's in direct communication with us whenever they have questions they can't answer um yeah. and they typically get with, back to everyone within an hour um you know i'm really close with our director of marketing here and um we text all the time so whenever there's questions we we get back to people immediately and we're here like when there's a show day like today i've been here since nine i'm not leaving until the last intermission ends like if there's issues, we're answering the phones and we're we're here to help everyone get their tickets and make sure everything's going through seamlessly. And it's like every day for shows, weekends too, you know, that's that's what's making our audience come back, you know. I, I don't know. I mean, I understand that, you know, bigger companies like airlines, et cetera, 
they have limited customer service. They used to be all the time, but mm -hmm. um, not so much anymore. But yeah, no, we're here and we're answering the phones and we're making sure our, we get our audience in. Mm -hmm. I, I'll share with you at my first job interview. It's a phrase that stayed with me. My first job interview for ticketing, the GM said to me, it's a great phrase that stuck with me. And he said, we're in the entertainment business. We're working when everyone else is having fun. Mm -hmm. And if you can't handle that, this is not the industry for you. And I and that that was over 21 years ago. And that phrase has stayed with me because, you know, I really, I don't like clock watchers who at 5.30 are going to scuttle off when we've got a big show or on sale tomorrow. Um, right. And I think that's that's our whole business, not just that you know in the front of the house, you know, team or the, the marketing team or technical team. You know, we're in the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. Yep. So true. And people are here to have fun and great experiences. And you know, our role in technology is to make it easier, not harder. So um, I think that's a great place to wrap. And um, interesting direction we took today and i think it's i got a very common sense panel so i love it um i appreciate all of you your input has been incredible and i'll just check quickly and see if we've got any questions and then uh we'll get you out of here when you're thorough you don't get a lot <laughs> so i don't see oh hold on that's the chat window I do see some questions. Um, somebody did ask, should we be concerned uh, adding pixels to the ticketing page for tracking uh, conversion? And is the consumer information protected? Um, Greg, you touched on that a little bit. You want yeah. to respond? Need, you need to be really careful about that stuff. I mean, um, I won't go in, into the technical details of it, but when you put someone else's tracking pixel and it's it's normally script not mm -hmm. not a pixel a pixel is a fallback um you're giving them you're giving that script access to all of the information on the page right and there are a bunch of mechanisms that they can that they can um, relay that back to home right um that's what the the pixel is there for it's to send information back to an some sort of analytics service mm -hmm. um with with some amount of data so um on your checkout page absolutely not um, right. unless you unless you're doing redirect payments and the, the credit cards being put in on a third-party site anywhere where there's um, credit card input absolutely not um, and be very very careful about anywhere where people are putting in their personal information um, you really should be getting someone with the technical skills to to review that pixel code carefully um, to make sure it's not doing anything um, wrong and once you put it on, you have to have your IT team keeping track of the vul vulnerabilities of that tool because things change all the time. People discover, discover vulnerabilities. And so these attacks happen when, um, when someone discovers a vulnerability and then someone, ex someone else will exploit it and, and, and they'll use it to inject some of their own code onto sure. your page. So you've got to be really careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a self-service thing. <laughs> nope. Let me just pop that on there. That looks like that's all our questions that have popped in at the moment. So thanks, Paul, for that. And if you have more, you can always uh, send us a note and we'll get it out to the right folks. But uh, Kathleen, thank you so much. Uh, Andrew, Greg, appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy days um, and giving us some fantastic input. And I hope you have a good afternoon and a good evening and get a good meal and a good night's sleep. Thanks, everybody. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Bye.